Hey everyone, so my favorite investor of all time is Peter Lynch. He obtained 29% annualized returns when he managed the Fidelity Magellan Fund during the late 1970s and throughout the 1980s. In the 1990s, I read his two books. The first one was One Up on Wall Street. And then after reading that, I also read Beating the Street. I went ahead recently and I reread Beating the Street. And I wanted to understand if the lessons from Peter Lynch are still as relevant today as they were back then. And quite frankly, I was shocked. There are eight lessons that I want to share in the video today from Beating the Street that have really resonated with me during our current era. But what I want to do actually is just jump into my first takeaway because the first takeaway really is how Peter Lynch set the stage for my entire investing career. When I read his books back in the 1990s, one of the first themes that Peter Lynch said that resonated with me was investing in companies that I understand, investing in companies that are out there in front of me literally on a day-to-day -day basis that I can really understand because I'm a consumer of such companies. I took his suggestion too hard and when I went ahead and started deploying money, a lot of money, when I was making money in my career, I went ahead, I followed the Peter Lynch strategy, and it worked for me. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, this is really theme number one. And theme number one is buying what you know. This is one of the most basic things that Peter Lynch shares. And you can see on there that I have seen success employing his strategy. I go through some of my household name positions. I have Clorox, The Home Depot, Johnson & Johnson, Kimberly Clark, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, and Altria. These are all brands that we are familiar with. And these are brands that I'm familiar with. I understand them. And so when I really started building my portfolio, which was really around 2011, although in 2009, that's when I went and started going heavy in the sin stocks like Altria, I um, went ahead and I followed what I learned from Peter Lynch and I bought these household names. And you can see on the screen here when I express my results through the first tranche, through my first purchase of each of these stocks. And obviously I've averaged into these stocks more and more over the years, but you can see in general, the strategy has worked. I highlight some of my favorite returns on here. One of my favorites is the Home Depot. Boy, I'm up 331% on my first tranche and my simple yield on cost, which just takes the current dividends and divides by my initial tranche purchase price of 74.51, it's now over 10%. I am yielding on a simple basis over 10% on my first tranche of the Home Depot. And who doesn't get the Home Depot? It's so easy to understand that company. I don't have to go out and understand some crazy new technology. I don't have to understand what's going on with AI, with artificial intelligence right now. There's all this news in the media right now about AI. Maybe AI will benefit the Home Depot at some point. I love investing in old school companies like the Home Depot because because they don't have to invent the new technologies. They can just adopt the new technologies to benefit their business. But as you can see on the screen in front of you, I have a few more that I highlighted. I um, highlighted Johnson & Johnson. Surprisingly, this one, my first tranche is now yielding 7.75%, which is great because their dividend increases have been a little slower than I would have liked to see, but still great uh, simple yield on cost on my first tranche. McDonald's is another fabulous one. I'm yielding 8.27% on my first tranche, which um, was purchased at 73.53. I'm actually up 271% capital gains on my first tranche. Altria, my favorite of all, my SIN stock that I've listed here, I'm up 191% on that first purchase. But more importantly, my yield on cost on a simple basis is 23.51%. And so put in simple terms, for every $100 I invested in that first tranche, I'm yielding $23.51 per year. 
and that dividend income is going up over time. Personally, I invest for cash flow. I love that the stocks that I just shared, I have seen capital appreciation in them, but that is not the most important thing for me. It is sustainably growing cash flow that I can use to personally pay my bills. And already I'm paying some of my bills with cash flow, but I am also reinvesting a lot of dividends right now as well because I want the dividend snowball to get larger. But as you can see on the screen, in front of you by employing Peter Lynch's strategy. It's worked out really well for me, but I must mention, of course, um, yes, I have losers in my portfolio too. I'm just sharing some of the highlights here to express that the words I, of wisdom that I took in from Peter Lynch way back in the 90s, they have served me well even to this day, especially over the last, say, 10 or 15 years. One of the funny things, by the way, is Peter Lynch jokes that he always had IBM. I have IBM too, so I'm glad he could joke about that. I guess I can joke about it in my portfolio too. Now, one thing I highlight here on this slide, one of the things I think is really important when reading these types of books is to go into some deep thought. Go into some thought exercises and understand, does this still work? Just because Peter Lynch's strategy worked for me over the last, say, 10 or 15 years, right now in 2023, does it still work? Is it still relevant? Is buying these household brand names still a winning strategy? I'm employing this strategy right now in 2023. I'm going after my core four. A lot of you have heard of this strategy already. I'll link to it in the pinned comment below, but I'm going after some of my core stocks this year. That being said, I'm starting to get a little bit discouraged about core stocks for a few reasons. One, dividend growth rates are slowing. Two, our society is kind of attacking these types of stocks because I think any big successful company, whether it's the um, litigation, whether it's political leaders, whether it's just the media, it seems like a lot of people are going after the, these companies. And that wasn't a thing when I started out buying these stocks back in the day. That wasn't a thing at all. And I don't think it was a thing back in the 1980s when um, Peter Lynch was buying these stocks. And so there are a number of events that give me pause right here. Does Peter Lynch's strategy of buying household brands still work right now? I don't know. Personally, I'm still employing his strategy, but also I am starting to evolve my strategy a little bit as well, especially looking into 2024. But you put on the comments below, I would love to hear your opinion on the matter. Um, by the way, I have seven more huge takeaways in the video today that I wanted to share with all of you. I know this was a super long introduction. Get ready, everyone, for a really exciting dividend stock investing video. Welcome to PPC Ian. This is Dividend Stock Investing for everyone. All right, everyone. So theme number one, the concern I expressed at the end of that theme, it goes directly into theme number two that I took away from beating the street. Check it out on the screen right now. Theme number two, believe it or not, is that there was a lot of worry back in the early 1980s. A lot of worry. And there's a lot of worry today. I just shared some worries that I have about core stocks. Hey, the politicians are going after them. Hey, the media is going after them. Hey, they're priced to perfection. I've got a little bit of worry. But Peter Lynch in the early 1980s, he had some worries, or I guess he didn't have quite as many worries, but it seemed like investors overall had a lot of worries back then. And he even shared in his book, in the early years of Fidelity Magellan, there was money being taken out of the fund. He had to combine the fund with other funds to keep a critical mass. For a number of years there, Fidelity wasn't even taking on new money because no new money really wanted to invest in mutual funds. This is how bad things were back then. And so sometimes we all think here in 2023, things are terrible. They're so bad. They couldn't get worse. But what's so interesting is to take a 
look back into time through my favorite investor's uh, lens and to see that the landscape back then in the early 1980s, it wasn't so different from what it is now. There was a lot of worry and a lot of panic back then as well. And what time has uh, showed us investors is sometimes this healthy amount of worry and skepticism. It keeps the market in check. Usually it's a good thing for stock market investors, but as you can see on the screen right now, I want to share a few quotes. On page 36, he said, the key to making money in stocks is not to get scared out of them. This point cannot be overemphasized. And he also said on page 306, a stock market decline is as routine as a January blizzard in Colorado. If you're prepared, it can't hurt you. A decline is a great opportunity to pick up bargains left behind by investors who are fleeing the storm in panic. He went on to share in the book that so many investors are scared and fearful of losing money that over time in the mutual fund industry, he saw more and more bond-oriented mutual funds gaining adoption. He said in in um, 1980, 69% of money was in stock mutual funds. But by kind of the, the latter part of his career around 93, or latter part of his career at Fidelity Magellan, that is, um, he's still an advisor at Fidelity to my understanding. Um, he was saying that about 75% of mutual fund dollars were in bond funds. And so sometimes we all feel like the times we live in are doomed. They're the worst. They couldn't get any uh, worse. But really my key insight from all of this is that our worries today, maybe they're not so different from the worries of the past. Yes, they're, we're worried about different types of topics perhaps, but this worry has always been there. And one of the things that gets me as an investor and one of the reasons I question my strategy right now in 2023 of adding money to my core four stocks is I start thinking, is this time different? I'm awfully worried about a number of things uh, right now in society, in the economy. But back then, Peter Lynch and other investors had a ton of worry as well. And so that's kind of the check and balance that keeps me going forth towards my dreams, pursuing my core dividend stock strategy um, in my own portfolio. By the way, if you enjoy the video so far, my book summary here of Beating the Street, please go ahead and click the like button. It really does mean the world to me. And by the way, if you haven't checked it out yet, check out Corner Patreon. I have Corner Patreon. Um, I have a lower tier of Patreon called Backyard Patreon as well, where I share all my stock trades. But on Corner Patreon, I now have Zoom meetups. And we recently did a Zoom-based book club where we discussed this very book. It was a lot of fun. And I'm in process of scheduling the next meetup for Corner Patreon. We do these meetups on Zoom from time to time, and they're always a lot of fun. But I want to keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next theme that I wanted to share from Beating the Street is really this kind of a critique of my own strategy, if you will. I want to understand right now, is buy and hold forever really a viable strategy or is some active portfolio management required? Like I said, when I read any book, I look at it to really analyze what the author is saying and how it could pertain to my own strategy. And I want to be humble and I want to be open to change and I want to be critical of my own strategy, not just assume it's the best thing ever. And so all of you know who have been here a while that I buy and hold stocks forever. Sometimes I sell, but it's very rare. But Peter Lynch, he's my favorite investor. He has had some very active management in his fund. He did a lot of buying and selling. Even more importantly, he shares his 50 most important important stocks um, on page 136 from, uh, from 1977 through 1990. And some of the stocks on the list are kind of evergreen buy and hold forever winners. But some of them, quite frankly, are stocks that I really wouldn't want to buy and hold forever. He owned, for example, Boeing, Coca-Cola, Cracker Barrel, Dunkin' Donuts, Gillette, PepsiCo, Philip Morris, so on and so forth. I put some notes on the slide here, which ones I own or which ones I used to own. And um, Usually if I used to own a stock, by the way, it's usually because I had it and then I needed to sell it to um, either raise capital for a real estate deal or raise capital for buying a uh, residence because over the years I've had to sell stocks from time to time to uh, purchase uh, residences that we live in. Uh, but anyway, um, I, it was great to see on his list, even back from 77 to 1990, that many of the stocks still resonate with me today and I own many of them. However, there are certain stocks that were 
were on the list that I wouldn't really feel comfortable owning today, like Circuit City, Cooper Tire, Ford Motor, King World Productions, Pet Boys, Pick and Save, Sabaro. A lot of these are private or have been acquired at this point, but these aren't the type of evergreen buy and hold companies that forever companies that I would want to own. And to be fair, we shared this and we discussed this on my meetup. Peter Lynch's strategy, if it were buy and hold forever, maybe he wouldn't have bought some of these stocks, but also then his returns probably wouldn't have been as high either. He generated a lot of returns through trading, through uh, buying themes and then selling them when they have appreciated in price and then rotating into completely different asset classes. And that served him very, very well. That just doesn't resonate. That part of it doesn't resonate with me as well. I'm a buy and hold forever investor because that's what aligns with my risk tolerance and overall just with my personality. But anyway, all of this gives the backdrop that, hey, Ian, you're getting a lot of comments these days. I have a lot of subscribers who write into me, whether it's in comments or emails on social media. I'm on Instagram, by the way, Twitter. Um, I link to those in the pinned comment below. I get people writing in and a lot of them are sharing that, Ian, I am abandoning individual dividend stocks right now. And I am just uh, going for uh, ETFs or uh, managed mutual funds like SCHD. As you can see on the screen right now, SCHD, as I highlight there in... Um, Yellow, that is the Charles Schwab Dividend Oriented ETF. And more or less, I believe that there's a low turnover there. I didn't look at it before producing this video, but I think that a lot of the reasons that investors are going towards that ETF is it basically lessens exposure to any one single company that could cause risk in the portfolio, but also there's some element of active management in there. There's an element that, hey, if a company that was once very relevant becomes outdated, hey, the fund does not need to own it anymore. And it kind of goes a little bit into Peter Lynch's strategy that sometimes it makes sense to sell a stock, even though that's not something I want to do. That's something that has served many investors well over time. And so it's more of a takeaway point for me. I probably won't change my ways. What I usually do if I do decide to change my ways is I leave in the past what I've already done. And then with net new money deployed, I kind of morph it into something new. And so it resurfaces this question for me though, Ian, does it make sense to supplement the portfolio with some SCHD? There's an awful lot about that fund that resonates with me after reading Peter or after rereading Peter Lynch's book. Let me know though in the comments below if you own SCHD. I'd love to learn your experience with it. Do you appreciate the fact that you can outsource with that fund a little bit of the management and that if there is a loser that doesn't make sense anymore, that they can cut it, they can curate it, they can optimize the list of stocks that they own, of course, while trying to keep turnover as low as possible. I'd love to know. Share in the comments below. But I want to keep going because I have a lot of themes to cover today. And I know some of these longer videos, it's harder to stick in here. I do encourage you to check out the timestamps to save every one time. I have extensive timestamps on all the videos. But the next theme, as you can see on the screen right now, check it out in front of you. Theme number four that I took out of the book is that Really, uh, small investors have so much upside. All of us here today, including myself in the scheme of things, are smaller investors. We're not institutions. And some of the statistics that Peter Lynch shares in the book, one of my favorite statistics on page 32 is when he starts talking about these 10,000 investment clubs. And he talks about that the majority of NAIC, the National Association of Investors Corporation Clubs, these are local clubs that meet up that invest in stocks together as a group. A lot of them, the majority of them have beaten the S&P 500. Peter Lynch goes on to speak in his own book that when Magellan was smaller, in some ways, he had the advantage out there because he could buy up small cap companies or a good percentage of small cap companies, and it would be meaningful in his fund and it would drive a lot of value. But as the fund got larger, those small positions, they really didn't make a bigger big enough difference. And he had to start going towards larger companies. When I was reading all of this, honestly, my takeaway was this is great. I think individual investors, the majority of us who are watching this channel right now, myself included, we can 
rest assured that there's some advantage we have out there over the pros. And one just simple advantage, for example, that Peter Lynch discussed is he had rules around his fund. There were certain quote unquote approved uh, stocks that he may or may not be able to buy. He certainly said that some of his competitors out there at other mutual funds, they literally had a list of stocks that was approved. And if it wasn't on that list, they couldn't buy it. He also talked about position size. Certain positions could only be so big in the portfolio. He also talked about the fact that um, certain positions he couldn't buy more than a certain percentage of an entire company. But us individual investors, us smaller investors, we don't have these rules. With Starbucks, for example, I bought a huge, massive position in that company, probably much bigger than any mutual fund could ever do in good conscience. And I believe that that gives me a competitive advantage as a smaller investor. So with theme number four, my big takeaway with that particular theme is that there's a lot of hope and a lot of promise for those smaller investors like those of us watching this channel that we have an opportunity out there even in 2023 even when things seem really difficult we have an opportunity another interesting topic though on theme number four. And I want to thank a uh, corner patron. Uh, his name is Mike. Thank you, Mike. Mike has actually attended a few of the Zoom meetups now. It's been so fun to, uh, to get to know you on the Zoom meetups, Mike. He shared another takeaway from this theme that I wanted to share with you all. And he basically shared how Peter Lynch, as his fund got bigger and bigger, he kept having the great returns. But it seems like his overhead and his kind of workload, his effort in managing the fund, especially because it just got so massively large, it got more difficult. And at a certain point, he even talked about how he didn't see his family that much. It was kind of like ships passing in the night between him and his wife. They didn't even see each other barely because he was working so hard. But it goes to show that with dividend stock portfolios like we have as well, in the early days, it's kind of easy, but as the portfolios get larger over time and there are more decades behind a portfolio, even for us, it can get a little more difficult because with a built-in gain, for example, selling a stock, that's a big deal because it can trigger some capital gains, some serious capital gains. Just look how much, how well I've done on the Home Depot, for example. I wouldn't want to sell that stock just uh, for the pure um, uh, uh, risk of, of just creating a huge taxable event. It's not worth it. So I will hold that company company forever. I plan to hold it forever regardless, but still Mike's point that, hey, as our portfolios get larger, like Peter Lynch's, there's more complexity as well. And what that tells a lot of us as well is it sure is a good idea in the early days to formulate a really solid strategy and to stick with it. Let's keep going. As you can see on the screen now, I have my fifth theme today that I took away from beating the street. I kind of hinted at this earlier, but I'm going to approach it a little differently these days. When I read these books, I always wonder, has the game changed since Peter Lynch's Magellan days? And here's an area of the market where I think it might have changed. So one thing that Peter Lynch highlights is that retailers did really well for him. Between 1977 and 1990, he had a 50 most important retailers that he shared on page 138. He also had a chapter on it starting on page 150 and he really spoke how he would go to his local mall. He would speak with his kids. He would speak with his wife. He would understand which brands are doing really well. Then he would research them. He would wait. He had a lot of time. He wouldn't really just jump on it. He would wait till they turn a profit. And back then, Wall Street wasn't so competitive, but also there wasn't a lot of data available. So he had to get the data um, with his hands. He literally had to go to the stores. He had to talk to managers. He had to go to the executives. He had to have meetings. He had to pull reports. We, he didn't have the internet back then, so it was difficult. But because he didn't have the internet, news was very slow to travel. And what was so interesting back then is he found these retailers that did really well in one market and established themselves in one market. And then he could invest in them before they moved and branched out into other markets and kind of went national. And by doing that, he had a lot of benefit. But I'll tell you, I did a very Peter Lynch style investment when I bought Dutch Bros. Dutch Bros, however, as you can see on the screen right now, it's already priced to perfection. Yes, they started out in the Oregon market, but by the time this thing went public, and I'll link to my Dutch Bros video, I had a few videos in the pinned comment below, it was already priced to perfection because of the internet. It was already priced right now as if it has 4,000 stores. It's only gonna have 800 stores as of 23. Uh, sometime this year, they'll hit their 800 stores. But 
I think right now they're priced as if they already have their long-term goal of 4,000 plus stores. It's trading right now at a PE of 109. This is a rare exception. I rarely buy a non-dividend stock, but I bought this company because it is a Peter Lynch style investment other than being a value. It's not a value, but I really do believe that this company will continue to expand and they have a secret sauce, but they're trading at 9.6 times revenue right now. And so my question to all of you and to myself is, hey, Dutch Bros, maybe that's just an outlier but what do you all think? Put in the comments below in our modern day, does this retail strategy still work or is it outdated? I kind of wonder, for example, if because of the internet news travels so fast that by the time these retailers are somewhat successful, they're already priced for their full expansion nationwide. I know right now Dutch Bros, they're primarily in Idaho, where I live. They're in um, California. They're, they're in um, Oregon. They're in, I think, Texas now, but they're kind of expanding now outward throughout the US. But my question is literally by the time they went public, were they already priced for the entire expansion with no upside for investors? That's very possible. This one was more of a passion investment for me. I just wanted to own shares in the company, but it certainly doesn't drive cash flow. Although one day they'll pay a dividend. Hopefully we never, we never know, but I hope. Anyway, let me know in the comments below what you think. I want to keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I have theme number six. And so I love this one. Peter, Lynch on page 182, he talks about lousy industries, but he says there's great companies in lousy industries and they can make amazing investments. And I completely agree. He says in business competition is never as healthy as total domination. Boy, I own a company, Altria. I bought more of it today. My backyard patrons and my corner patrons already know this because they see all my stock trades that I share over on uh, Patreon. But I bought some Altria because it's trading at a forward PE of 9.18 and it has a starting yield of 8.09. I'd have to buy three times as much of a core four holding just to get the same cash flow as this I get, uh, this one, uh, just because the starting yield is so high. And Altria has made some real mistakes. They bought um, a huge stake in Jewel for a lot of money and it caused them a ton of trouble, set them back quite a bit. But that being said, it's a lousy industry with next to uh, no competition and really no new people trying to enter this industry. And it's made an amazing investment especially from a cash flow perspective. That goes back to slide number one where I shared my yield on cost in my first tranche. It's so interesting. And so I'd love to know in the comments below, are there any lousy industries where you see any great companies? The lousy industry that I love to invest in, and I started out in my early days almost exclusively on this industry. Then I spanned out into core stocks. Um, now I'm starting to get back to my roots a little bit and loading up on some of the SIN stocks again. But um, this has been a lousy industry where there's some great companies out there and there's not a lot of competition and they always seem to trade at a value level because everyone hates it. And quite frankly, there's a lot of mutual funds out there where probably have their hands tied that can't even buy these stocks because of social implications. And that creates a sustaining value uh, bias on these stocks, in my humble opinion. And uh, that was one takeaway from Peter Lynch that I feel still rings true to this very day. And I love to see it in the book and it reinforced what I'm doing um, a bit. But let's keep going. As you can see next on the screen, I want to share theme number seven. Peter Lynch really takes joy in down markets and real wealth is accumulated during corrections. On page 142, he says, in the festive atmosphere that surrounded the recent 300 point gain in the Dow in three weeks, I was the most depressed person on the panel. I'm always more depressed by an overpriced market in which many stocks are hitting new highs every day than in a beaten down market in a recession. And also on page 142, he says recessions, I figure, will always end sooner or later. And in a beaten down market, there's bargains everywhere you look. But in an overpriced market, it's hard to find anything worth buying. And so these two quotes really hit home for me. It's a psychological trick that has served me so well as an investor over the years. And that is to fool myself that when stocks are down to feel good and to buy stocks and that when stocks are up to be a little bit more cautious. When the pandemic came and stocks were just tanking in 2020, I was buying dividend stocks, high quality names almost every day. 
And that has served me well uh, to this day by really leaning into the recession, leaning into the correction, if you will, and uh, knowing that sooner or later this bad news will pass and things will get back to normal. Who would have known that it would have recovered so far so quickly? It is just astounding. But this is timeless knowledge from Peter Lynch that surfaces in this book, Beating the Street, that I think is a good reminder to all of us that when times get bad, a lot of us are fearful. A lot of us are like those investors in Magellan in the early 80s that just want to redeem our shares, put it in cash, put it in bonds, and run. That is the natural human instinct. But Peter Lynch, and also now myself, because I have learned from him, I've learned from the greats, and I've learned from my experience, and it wasn't always this way. There have been market corrections I've been through where I've been terrified. I've only gotten this way, say, in the last five or 10 years, that now I celebrate a market correction just because I've been through it so many times, so many times. And this also ties in to the theme I shared earlier, where Peter Lynch was just discussing how the investing atmosphere in the early 80s was so fearful. I think there are cycles that repeat throughout society, throughout the eras, and there's always going to be a recession. There's always going to be fear. There's always going to be a correction. But these are the opportunities where real wealth is accumulated. And so I loved reading that in Beating the Street. But I want to keep going. I want to share the last theme that I took away from rereading Beating the Street. As you can see on the screen right now in front of you, the last theme that I wanted to share, number eight, is that never forget, retiring early, it is the goal, even for Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch ran Magellan from 1977 through 1990. Magellan was up over 2,700% during that time period. Can you believe that? He retired in 1990 at the age of 46, the young age of 46. And he did this because... Look, he loved what he was doing, but also he wasn't seeing his wife. He wasn't seeing his kids. His net worth surely got pretty large. He did really well running the fund so successfully. On page 130, he said, my visits with companies, either at our place or at their places or at investment seminars, it had escalated from 214 in 1980 to 330 in 82, 489 in 83, back down to 411, 463, and then 570 in 1986. He said, if this kept up, I figured I'd be seeing an average of two companies per day in person, including Sundays and holidays. This was an insane work schedule. It took something that he loved, but I think he probably, he doesn't say this in the book, but I think he probably realized, I cannot do this forever. And I think a lot of us dividend investors, especially those of us watching who are kind of like at my age, I'm in, I, I'm in my 40s, um, surely those of us watching who are maybe in your 50s or 60s, I've already found this in my 40s, that I'm not the same Ian in my 40s that I was in my 20s. You just don't kind of have the same necessary... Um, energy level, ability to work those insane hours, ability to just not sleep at all. And things change as you get older. And I think just your interests in life too, you want to have more time. You want to enjoy the rewards of all of the hard work. And this really resonated with me because Peter Lynch, he's one of the greats, the best in the investment community of all time. And he had such a good attitude with all of his humor. It's so funny reading his humor in the book, throughout the book. He has all these jokes. Um, he must have been just such a fun person to work with because he approached everything with just such a positive and kind of whimsical and funny outlook on uh, life. And so we need more of that. But even Peter Lynch, with all of his humor and his good attitude, he realized at age 46, look, I'm done. Now, he's still participating in the investment community. I'm sure he's on many boards and he's still an advisor at Fidelity, but I'm sure he's also enjoying the benefits that he created for himself through hard work. And the game here that a lot of us are discussing on this channel is how do we reach financial independence, retire early? And a lot of us are trying to do it really young. Some of us are trying to do it kind of mid-age, like I'm in my 40s, surely by... Um, not so long from now, quite frankly, I, um, I want to slow down and I'm, I'm ready to slow down and I'm ready to start um, taking more time for things other than work and kind of be semi-fire. Um, and so it's just interesting. Sometimes we feel guilty for doing that. I'll tell you myself, I shared this on Patreon recently in my post today. Each of my trades there, I share like a blog post. And I was just sharing how sometimes, I don't know if it's because of social media or what it is, I feel guilty for taking even one minute off. I feel kind of in the modern world, if I'm not working, I'm doing something wrong. But I've also realized that that's got to change. And what supports that changing 
is the massive cash flow, which brings us all the way back to theme one and why we do what we do in the dividend investing community. Thank you for watching the video today. If you enjoyed the video, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel. It really means the world to me. And, um, I am so grateful for all of those subscriptions. Also, don't forget to click that uh, like button as well. Before we go, in terms of a full disclosure, I am long all the stocks mentioned today. I'm going to pull it up right now. I am long Starbucks, SBUX. I'm long Dutch Bros, BROS. I am long IBM, ticker IBM. I am long Clorox, ticker CLX, The Home Depot, ticker HD, Johnson & Johnson, ticker j and I am also long Kimberly Clark, KMB. Coca-Cola, KO, I'm long McDonald's, MCD. I am long PepsiCo, PEP, Procter & Gamble, ticker PG. I am long Altria, MO. I am long Philip Morris, ticker PM. I am long Royal Dutch Shell, RDSA. Or actually, now the ticker's SHEL, by the way. I am also long Unilever, UL. I own all of those stocks in my personal dividend stock portfolio. Also, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video, it's not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult your licensed investment advisor first. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. It's possible to lose money in the stock market. Uh, this is not investment advice. All right, everyone. I love you all. Let me know if you've read either the One Up on Wall Street, which was Peter's first book, or um, Beating the Street, the second book. I would love to know your big themes, your big takeaways in the comments below. I love you all. I will see you in the next Dividend Stock Investing video. Oh, 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 oh,